we're on meeting. And also, one of our speakers, uh, Kate Rowan, who's uh, on the faculty at University of California in San Francisco, who's been involved in the scientific work as, as well as in the summer. And the reason we're having it is because we are fortunate here at OHSU, due to the hard work of a couple of parents and a number of professionals, to be hosting. DCH is very kindly hosting the fifth annual uh, Costello Syndrome Parent Support Group meeting. Uh, which is an uh, international meeting. And also, one of our speakers, uh, Kate Rowan, who's uh, on the faculty at University of California in San Francisco, who's been involved in the scientific work as, as well as the pediatric aspects of, of this and related conditions, was very fortunate to obtain NIH funding for an all-day symposium on Saturday here uh, dealing with uh, Costello syndrome as well. And uh, I've had little or nothing to do with it, but I just to introduce, I'll introduce our first speaker, and then she can introduce uh, Dawn McCready Santos and Lisa Scheuer uh, and get things rolling. So, Kate. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And actually, you all had a lot to do with it because if... Um, if you guys weren't here, we wouldn't be here. So thank you for hosting in, in such a wonderful place. So today, it's, it's going to be a tag team approach. We're going to divide this talk into three parts. I'm going to give an overview of the RASMAP kinase pathway and the syndromes associated with it. And Don McCready Santos um, of the Costello Syndrome Family Network is going to talk about life for a child Life for a Family of a Child with Chronic Health Care Needs. And Lisa Scheuer, uh, President of the Costello Syndrome Family Network, is going to talk about one parent's experience raising a child with Costello Syndrome. So the RAS pathway is a critical signal transduction pathway. It's highly controlled. It's a complex intracellular signaling network that involves the transduction of an extracellular stimuli resulting in an intracellular effect. And it's, it's been very well studied in the context of cancer. So just to give you an overview of how the RAS pathway works, RAS is activated, as I mentioned, by diverse extracellular stimuli, including <coughs> receptor tyrosine kinases, G protein coupled receptors, cytokine receptors, and extracellular matrix receptors. And once these cell surface receptors receive an ex environmental um, stimulus or signal, it results in autophosphorylation, and these sites interact with growth factor receptor bound protein 2, also known as GRB2, which is an adapter protein that recruits son of sevenless homolog, or SOS, and SHIP2, which is the protein product of PTPN11 that encodes a non-receptor tyrosine phosphatase. So at that time, RAS is also recruited to the membrane, and it interacts with SOS. And SOS is a guanine nucleotide exchange factor, also known as a RAS GEF, which helps to increase the speed at which bound GDP is replaced by GTP on RAS. So it basically makes RAS go. It's an assistant. And, as, um, and RAS itself is just a small GTP binding protein. And it acts as basically a cellular on-off switch, depending on if it's bound to GTP in the on position or GDP in the off position. And in order to help turn RAS off, you can't make the signal go all the time. You have to turn it off there are cellular molecules called RAS gaps, and they basically turn RAS off. So the RAS pathway, as I mentioned, it's huge. It's super important in, in uh, cell transduction. But if we look at it in more of a simpler uh, schematic here, RAS really is a signaling hub inside the cell. And it has several downstream effectors or downstream cascades that it signals to. And we're just going to briefly talk about four today and more extensively about one. 
The first one is a cascade that's mediated by RAF, and it's known as the mitogen activated protein kinase pathway. And it's, in, it's important in <clears throat> cell cycle progression, in transcription, in differentiation, in survival, and cellular motility. Another cascade, which, da- which is downstream from RAS, is known as the RAL GDS pathway, and it's important for transcription, for membrane trafficking, and for vesicle formation. The PI3 kin- kinase is also um, regulated by RAS, and it's important in cell cycle progression, in survival, transcription, translation, and cell motility. And the PLC epsilon pathway, also downstream and regulated by RAS, is important for nuclear transport and calcium signaling. So today we're just going to be focusing on the MAP kinase pathway, which is one of the cascades downstream from RAS. So if we look at it a little bit more closely, once RAS is activated, RAF is recruited from the cytosol to the membrane. And then RAS itself, it's not as simple as just one RAS and one RAF and one MEC and one ERK. Um, They all exist in families. So the RAS exists as a family of GTPases, of which KRAS, HRAS, and NRAS are the major players. And all of our cells have all of these molecules. And the three RASs can equally recruit RAF. And RAF also exists as a family, BRAF, CRAF1, and ARAF. And RAF itself is activated by phosphorylation of other kinases. Once this all gets going, everything recruits to the cell membrane and all the action happens. And once RAF is activated, it goes on to phosphorylate and activate MEC1 and MEC2. And then once MEC1 and MEC2 are activated, it goes on to phosphorylate and activate ERK1 and ERK2. And then phospho-ERK is the main workhorse of this entire pathway. And it goes out into and uh, interacts with numerous cytosolic and nuclear substrates. So the way I look at this as a, as a geneticist is more like a biochemical pathway that we as pediatricians are, are more used to um, on everyday terms for biochemical genetic disorders. So I look at it kind of like a, a biochemical pathway, but it's a signal transduction pathway. So over the last couple of years, an extremely fascinating group of syndromes has emerged with causative mutations that have been identified in the components of this pathway. And these mutations cause an alteration of signaling down the pathway to affect the nucleus so phospho-ERK can go out and do its thing. So neurofibromatosis, which was actually uh, identified, the gene was identified in 1990, actually is encoded by a RAS gap. Noonan syndrome is also part of this pathway and is encoded, um, is found mutated in several different genes, and we're going to talk about all these later. Leopard syndrome is associated with this pathway. Gingival fibromatosis 1 is associated with this pathway. Capillary AV malformation syndrome associated with the pathway. Costello syndrome and CFC syndrome. So you can see now all these very similar syndromes actually are associated with this one pathway. So neurofibromatosis 1, or NF1, is autosomal dominant. It may be sporadic, or it may be transmitted through the family. It's relatively common with a prevalence of 1 in 3,500, and there are actually clinical diagnoses that can be made um, that were developed at the NIH, and that's that's routine clinically. um, It's clinically used um, uh, by clinicians. And it's caused by haploinsufficiency of neurofibromin, which is a RAS gap, which overall results in increased RAS activity down the pathway. So the diagnosis is made by the phenotype, where an individual has two or more of the following. Six or more cafe au lait macules, um, about a half a centimeter in its greatest diameter, in folks that are prepuberal, and one and a half centimeters in the greatest diameter for postpuberal Im- individuals. Now, freckling in the axillary and inguinal regions are also seen in NF1. 
neurofibromas of any type or plexiform neurofibromas are used as diagnostic criteria, optic nerve tumors, two or more Lish nodules, which are actually just innocuous iris hamartomas, so osseous lesions, such as depicted here, the tibial pseudoarthroses, are used and seen in NF1 individuals. And of course, a diagnostic criteria that's used is having a first degree relative with NF1. So cardiovascular abnormalities are actually few in NF1, but individuals, if they have um, a cardiac abnormality, can have pulmonic stenosis, aortic coarctation, conal truncal defects, mitral valve prolapse, or EKG abnormalities. In a study which uh, Angela Lynn did um, in 2000, looked at a large cohort of NF1 individuals, and which will be important later in the talk, in that study, no individuals had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Other issues that NF1 individuals can have are hypertension, vasculopathy, generalized osteopenia or osteoporosis, learning disabilities can occur in 50 to 75 percent of individuals, scoliosis, vertebral dysplasias, headaches are frequently reported, and individuals can have seizures or hydrocephalus. So as I mentioned, Noonan syndrome is also part of this pathway. Like NF1, it is autosomal dominant. It can be sporadic, or it can be transmitted through the germline. It's actually relatively common by medical genetics terms, if not maybe one of the most common syndromes, where one in about 2,500 individuals can have NF1. And it is caused um, by different genes, so it's genetically heterogeneous in that it can be caused by activating mutations um, in PTPN11, which encodes SHP2, in SOS1, in CRAF1, and perhaps KRAS. The jury's still out on whether or not KRAS is CFC or Noonan's. And the interesting thing about Noonan syndrome is these are not all the genes. There is still a gene or two or three out there that have yet to be identified. So the facial features of Noonan syndrome are characteristic. Individuals have a tall forehead, hypertelorism, down slanting palpebral fissures. They may have low set posteriorly rotated ears, a deep philtrum, a short neck. Uh, cardiovascular abnormalities um, may occur, and uh, pulmonary valve disease occurs in 20 to 50 percent. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, up to maybe a third. Um, septal defects, branch pulmonary artery stenosis, tetralogy of flow and arrhythmias are not as common, but they can occur. So as far as growth and development goes, um, these individuals typically are short. Um, their height usually follows along the third percentile during childhood development. And as they approach adulthood, they're at the lower limit, usually of normal. They rarely have growth hormone deficits. They do have gross motor delays and speech delays. And about a quarter to a third of individuals with Noonan syndrome can have learning disabilities. They also have skin findings, and it's um, not limited to keratosis pilaris, cafe au lait macules, and lentigines. They have other findings, but these are the most common. So with Noonan syndrome, they can have CNS abnormalities. About 10% have seizures. And when individuals have MRIs, there may be rare uh, malformations that are, are found as well. But hematologic issues and lymphatic issues are actually very common um, in Noonan syndrome. Affects about a third of individuals, and this might be a little bit of an underestimation. Um, individuals may have bleeding diathesis, uh, edema, which can be localized, like to the legs or a leg, or it can be generalized, uh, widespread edema. And uh, they may also have chylus effusion of pleural spaces in the peritoneum. So I mentioned leopard syndrome also is part of this pathway. And it too is autosomal dominant, but it's much more rare than NF1 and Noonan syndrome. And it too is caused by specific mutations in PTPN11. And leopard actually is an acronym that stands for lentigines, EKG conduction defects, um, ocular hypertelorism, pulmonic stenosis, abnormal genitalia, growth retardation, and deafness. 
And unlike Noonan syndrome, where the PTPN11 mutations ultimately result in increased signaling down the pathway, the common alleles that are found in leopard syndrome are actually catalytically uh, defective, and they act as dominant negative mutations where you, in, in culture, you don't get signaling down the pathway. And biochemical studies um, suggested that the leopard syndrome mutations actually alter the catalytic domain and result in an open, inactive form of SHIP2. So hereditary gingival fibromatosis is also caused by mutations in the pathway. It's a rare condition. It can be isolated. It can be part of a syndrome, and it can be caused by chromosomal abnormalities. Individuals who have this are affected, and they have benign, slowly progressive, non-hemorrhagic fibrous enlargement of the oral mucosa, and rare SOS1 mutations in the gene actually cause a frame shift and early termination of the protein. And recent biochemical data, which just came out in 07, have determined that this truncated protein is not is not loss of heterozygosity, which was originally thought, but it actually activates um, the MAP kinase pathway. So capillary malformation and AV malformation, also part of this pathway, and it consists of atypical, cutaneous, multifocal capillary malformations that are in association with high flow lesions. And it's caused by haploinsufficiency of RASA1 which encodes P120 RAS gap. So it's a RAS gap very similar to neurofibromin. They're in the same uh, family of uh, proteins. So Costello syndrome is rare, part of the pathway, and it's wonder and we guesstimate maybe that there are a few hundred individuals worldwide. This might be an underestimation. It's sporadic, presumably autosomal dominant. And it's caused by activating mutations in HRAS. Costello syndrome has very characteristic facial features. Coarse, their tip, uh, facial features are typically coarse. Children can have macrocephaly, high forehead, bitemporal narrowing. They can be telecanthic with downslanting palpebral fissures, epicanthal folds. Some have ptosis, the short nose, depressed nasal bridge, anaverted nares, low set ears, upturned lobe. Um, and cheeks may be full, and the mouth large with full lips. So cardiac issues of Costello syndrome include hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the Vaccine and Gene Therapy Institute seminar series. So if you'd like to learn more about the heart of Costello syndrome, I highly encourage you to attend. Angela is an excellent, excellent lecturer. So with regards to Costello syndrome, the Vaccine and Gene Therapy Institute seminar series, so if you'd like to learn more about the heart of Costello syndrome, I highly encourage you to attend. Angela is an excellent, excellent lecturer. So with regards to Costello syndrome, growth and development are basically 100% affected in these individuals. Most have failure to thrive. The majority have GI issues. The majority have short stature. Um, many children have growth hormone deficiency and gross motor delays and speech delay. And as far as CNS features, the um, majority, if not all, are hypotonic. There are a few individuals um, with Costello syndrome that have seizures. And CNS malformation of the brain usually includes a Chiari-1 malformation. They may have agenesis of the corpus callosum, hydrocephalus, or Danny Walker malformation. And when you look at the skin of Costello syndrome, very, very interesting findings that um, are not limited to the findings that I'm going to talk to you about here. So individuals may have generalized hyperpigmentation, and the skin itself is very unique, very soft and doughy, which later on may form calluses. Very texture, I mean, the texture is very velvety, and the majority have deep wrinkles in their palms and the sole. It's not pathognomonic for Costello syndrome. In fact, a lot of physicians Think about Costello syndrome having the deep um, creases, but individuals with CFC can also have deep creases as well. But what is not, well, not necessarily pathognomonic, but individuals with Costello, Costello syndrome, one way to help differentiate the two is papillomas. And these papillomas develop in the perioral and perianal area 
Um, they're just small little wart-like growths that are not due to a virus. Um, and, but they can develop anywhere on the skin. And the hair of individuals with Costello is variable, but most have fine, sparse, curly hair. But it can also be coarse as well. Again, it's, it's variable, but mostly curly. But there are some individuals with straight hair. Other issues of Costello syndrome can include hypoglycemia at birth, musculoskeletal issues, ocular abnormalities, and generalized osteopenia as the children get older. And finally, I want to talk about cardiofacial cutaneous syndrome. It too was rare, reported maybe a few hundred individuals worldwide, but I think again that's going to be an underestimation. It is sporadic, autosomal dominant like Costello, and it's caused by alteration of activation, probably increased activation um, down the MAP kinase pathway with mutations in BRAF and MEK1 and MEK2, so it involves an entire pathway. The craniofacial features are very similar to Noonan syndrome and Costello syndrome. And actually, the point of this slide is as a medical geneticist, when you get called to see an individual have cardiac issues, and they can include pulmonic stenosis, um, septal defects, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and heart valve anomalies, and arrhythmia FC have cardiac issues, and they can include pulmonic stenosis, um, septal defects, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and heart valve anomalies and arrhythmias. And even though it's cardiofaciocutaneous syndrome, again, there are about 20% of kids who do not have cardiac issues that we know of. The ectodermal anomalies um, are also, I have wide phenotypic variation. Don Siegel has, um, is just in the process of completing a study of looking at about 40 mutation positive individuals. Individuals can have sparse, curly, fine, thick, woolly, brittle hair. Eyebrows and eyelashes may be absent or normal. In fact, parenthetically, um, medical geneticists in the old days now used to use the lack of eyebrows as like the CFC sign. This child has CFC, does not have Costello syndrome because Costello syndrome kids have eyebrows. That is no longer the case. Do not use that because a lot of CFC kids have eyebrows now that we can do mutation testing. Skin, um, there may be xerosis, hyperkeratosis, ichthyosis, eczema, cafe au lait macules. The skin is really um, involved in CFC syndrome. Hemangiomas may be present, all erythema oophorogenes, generalized erythema of the skin. Keratosis pilaris is very common. Pigmented moles are really interesting, in fact, what we're finding is the children can be born with a couple of moles or a mole or two or develop a few in infancy. And for the majority of patients, as the kids get older, the number of moles progresses in number. It's absolutely amazing. They can have hyperkeratosis of the feet, um, the, so, the hands, knees, areas that actually are overpressure areas. And neurologic complications are actually basically 100% in a study that Grace Yoon um, and all have just completed looking at 39 BRAF and MEK mutation positive individuals. Hypertonia, motor delay, and speech delay are basically seen in 100% of individuals. Cortical tract spot findings may be present, ocular involvement. Um, what really surprised us in this study was seizures are found in almost 40% of the cases, a little bit different from Costello syndrome. With the average age of onset at three years old, they can be tonic-clonic, absence, um, partial complex seizures, infantile spasms in almost a third. This is a really big problem in CFC kids. MRI findings, the most important one um, for CFC is ventriculomegaly. It was in the olden days, again, it was not thought to be important, um, but getting a cohort together and really looking at mutation-positive kids, we're finding that ventriculomegaly hydrocephaly is 66% of individuals. So as I mentioned, the, the RAS pathway is, has been studied in the context of cancer. That's where we know it best. That's where it's been studied. And so there are cancers that are associated with syndromes in this pathway. NF1, about 10% of individuals will, may develop peripheral sheath uh, tumors, pheochromocytomas, JMML. Noonan syndrome, also about 10%, ALL, JMML, rhabdomyosarcomas. Leopard syndrome, which is relatively rare. There have been a couple case reports, 
one or two individuals, uh, neuroblastoma or myeloid leukemia. Costello syndrome, um, 15 to maybe up to 20% around that range. Rhabdos, neuroblastoma, bladder cancer, plus a uh, few other various cancers. CFC syndrome, we still don't know yet. CFC syndrome's part of the MAP kinase pathway, basically is the MAP kinase pathway. And so far, there have been two cases reported with ALL. The ALL is very common in the pediatric population. These were BRAF positive individuals. Is there a connection? We don't know yet about CFC syndrome. We're studying a very young cohort of kids, but we don't know what's going to happen when these kids get older, um, if they're going to develop cancers or not. So what does the future hold for these individuals with aberrant RAS signal signaling? Um, constitutionally increased RAS signaling. The majority um, have the majority of these syndromes do have progressive evolving phenotype. And as I mentioned, this pathway has been very well studied in the context of cancer. And there are already a lot of therapeutics that have been developed or in development right now. So it's possible that we could use systemic therapies to reduce RAS signaling, and it actually may be of great benefit to this population of patients. And I know that there are some groups that have looked at this with NF1. Um, and so I think there are going to be a lot more groups that are going to focus on possible therapeutics um, in the future for this group and class of individuals. And so with that, I want to invite everyone um, to the first International Costello Syndrome Research Symposium taking place here in this very room. Um, on Saturday. It's going to give you a great opportunity, even if you could just stop by for an hour, meet the families. There will be a lot of kids, families here with CFC. We've got researchers coming in from all over the world. Um, and we end the day with the possibility of therapeutic options for these, for these kids. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Don McCready Santos. She's going to talk about life for a family of a child with chronic health care needs. And here's Don. Good morning. So I'm going to talk about what it's like to have a child with chronic health care needs. Um, I, when I was 23 years old, um, I, I was pregnant with my daughter, Marcella, and I had a lot of extra fluid. When we did an ultrasound, they found that her legs and arms were short and that her head and her body were very large. And so the OBGYN became very concerned and sent me to a perinatologist who decided to do an amniocentesis looking for, for rare forms of dwarfism. We had no family history of any genetic conditions, and so ultimately they attributed her proportions to my husband's Guatemalan descent. So we were told everything was okay. We did the karyotype, it was totally normal. So we expected a normal baby. Okay. Of course, <laughs> that's, she's right there, so I'm of course <laughs> concerned when she falls over. Um, so we expected a normal baby, although I definitely had this inner feeling that something was not right, and I, and I repeatedly told everybody that I knew something was not right. Finally, at 37 weeks, I was induced due to her large for gestational age. They were afraid she was going to be a 15-pound baby. <laughs> so um, I had some hypertension. They decided to induce me, and I had her at Providence. You guys all know Providence. And um, she... When she was born, the nurses and me transported to an NICU. So she was sent over to Emmanuel, and right away she had issues with hypoglycemia, polycythemia. She needed a transfer transfusion. And so they took the baby bubble, transported to an NICU. So she was sent over to Emmanuel, and right away she had issues with hypoglycemia, polycythemia. She needed a transfer transfusion. And so they took the baby bubble in the ambulance and sped down the freeway to Emmanuel. She had feeding issues from birth. Um, I was allowed to stay in the NICU with her. She was in there for the first couple of weeks, um, and I would feed her every two hours. 
And the nurses, I knew something was wrong. She would projectile vomit, and she wasn't able to suck, and I knew that this child had issues. I actually had an older daughter, and I nursed without any problem. And one of the NICU doctors told me that, or nurses, not doctors, told me I was inexperienced and just needed to try harder, that it was um, okay that it took her an hour and a half to nurse 15 cc's. So I was sent home with a scale, and I was told to monitor what she was taking and write it all down and take it to the pediatrician at the end of the week. So I did that. Um, I was completely exhausted because 24 hours a day, I would spend an hour and a half nursing her for two hour, every two hours. So I didn't have any sleep. She lost weight very quickly, as you can imagine. So we were sent to the hospital at age two weeks. And this is Marcella in her little bed. So she's a tiny, tiny baby. Um, they decided to put an NG tube, and I, was, I, I learned how to place an NG tube, which was very frightening for me because I'd never had to do something like that ever. And um, she was a tiny baby, and she already had issues with her, her mouth. She would throw up, so I really had a hard time placing the NG tube. Um, we were, the best thing that they did, though, at the hospitals was, it was they referred us to a developmental pediatrician who specialized in feeding issues, and that was, you know, that was our saving grace. She was monitored in the hospital many times. Um, they would watch me nursing her. They would weigh her before and after, and, of course, she would not gain any weight. But we did that a few times. Eventually, she was placed with a G-tube, which was a really great thing. <laughs> Um, she spent many, many weeks in the hospital. Our whole life revolved around the hospital. I would go home. I would try to get my bills done. I would try to clean the house a little, spend a little time with my other daughter, and then we would spend weeks and weeks and weeks in the hospital. We would sleep in a little cot by the side, and those cots are so uncomfortable. And the nurses wake, you know, I had to wake up every so often, but then if I did sleep, the nurses would come in and do, you know, blood pressure, and it was, it was a very uncomfortable time. Um, and luckily, I don't remember a lot of what happened during those hospital stays. Um, she had lots of blood draws, lots of IV fluids. She had lots of anesthesia. We would do MRIs, um, scans. Everything needed anesthesia. We did lots and lots of skeletal surveys because we couldn't figure out why she wasn't growing at all. And this is the first time we came to genetic and metabolic clinics up here at OHSU. We saw Dr. Zanana, who's sitting over there. And at the age of five months, he suspected Costello syndrome, which is actually very, very early because uh, most kids are not diagnosed until they're much older. Um, but because she was so sick, we were sent to metabolic clinic because there was a lot of concern that it was not Costello syndrome, but um, a storage disorder because the, the phenotypes are very similar. So it's, and it happens a lot to a lot of our children, and especially with a severe failure to thrive. So we became www.drugs.com. <laughs> Our life became um, filled with all kinds of medications. So I, would, I learned how to hold my daughter down because she would get sweaty and cry and scream and nobody could place an IV. So I learned that in the hospital, I needed to learn how to hold her really well. Um, I remember when she was two weeks old, it actually took four of us to hold her down so that we could get one blood draw. <laughs> Um, we brought home many new drugs for newly discovered needs, and these are actually her current meds. So if you look up there, that's what she takes every day. She takes about 10 different medications and um, a special formula. She gets shots. Um, she takes growth hormone every day. She also takes some other shots once a month. Um, but it was a really scary thing for me to bring home all of these drugs for this little tiny baby and have to give her these drugs all the time. Um, I learned how to place and maintain G-tubes, and I did that because I didn't want to go to another clinic visit because we were already seeing 15 different specialists. So I really thought, you know, I could do this on my own, and I will, and the GI doctor was great. He said, yes, you can, and so he taught me how to do it. We got her first kangaroo pump, um, her first pulse ox, which was really fun, and her first nebulizer for her breathing issues. This was my favorite part of having a child with chronic health care needs, paperwork. <laughs> Um, I went from having no paperwork. This is my desk at home, and actually, I'm really good about shredding things now. <laughs> so this is nothing compared to what I had when she was an infant. And when you have a child like Marcella, you save everything because you think everything is absolutely the most important paper that you're going to lose um, and you're going to need it eventually. So 
you get um, papers from specialists, from therapists, from, you know, you get medical bills, prescriptions, lab slips, and you have to deal with the insurance company because they're always giving you trouble. Insurance companies are just, ugh, they're awful. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm sure you guys all understand that part. <laughs> So early intervention, okay, when you first put your child in early intervention, they do tons of testing and they send you tons of paperwork and you have to sign all of it and keep all of it and it's, it's just a mess. And then if you apply for SSI, which most parents do because with a child like Marcella, there are incredible medical costs and there's no way anybody could possibly afford to take care of a child like her without some sort of backup. And SSI is another mess of paperwork, I must say. So that was um, my side of the story, but I also had a three-year-old at the time when I had Marcella. And um, it was very hard for her. I was lucky I had my mother-in-law to take care of her um, at home, and so she didn't have to spend all of her time in the hospital because I really wanted her to have some sort of normal childhood, as, mu as normal as it could be. So, um, but she definitely had a very hard time. She did lots of play about hospitals. She would have her babies, and she would pretend that she was a mama taking them to the hospital. She would pretend she was giving them shots. She would pretend that she was giving them IV fluids. It was very sad. Um, she really wanted to take care of her little sister. I, she didn't have any issues with jealousy. It was all worry about her little sister. And she did have lots of tantrums. And I think for a child, children are kind of like little thermometers. And when things are hard, they really do know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't give them enough credit. And so the tantrums were really her way of dealing with the frustration and the difficult circumstances that she at age three was put through. Um, and she had lots of nightmares about her sister dying. She would often ask me if her sister was going to live at the age of three, which was very, very sad. And so that's her, that's Amanda in the little picture and I holding Marcella. Inexperience. <laughs> Though I had a, a typical child. I had no experience with a special needs child. And so what I thought was normal really probably wasn't. Um, I thought it was normal that my child never slept. Um, and she didn't sleep until the age of four through the night. And I really thought that was normal for medically fragile babies. So I never said a word. Even though we were seeing all these specialists, I never told them that she didn't sleep. <laughs> um, I didn't have any help. You learn very quickly when you have a child with special needs that people have a hard time dealing with your situation. It's very hard for them to see a child going through what your child is going through. So a lot of people end up leaving you. Um, and so help is really hard. I did have help from my mother-in-law, but it was only to a certain degree. Um, Marcella threw up 14, 14 times every single night. <laughs> um, and I thought that was normal as well. <laughs> um, as I say, I just thought, well, you know, that's reflux. And I did actually talk to the doctor about that. And he said, no, she has reflux. Um, but obviously, it didn't help with her weight gain. And during that time, I really wasn't worried about anything anyway, because my only concern was her weight and that my child was dying before my eyes. At age one, this is Marcella. We t she actually got um, the stomach flu. And we, she spent her first birthday in the hospital. And we were told to take her home and let nature take its course. <laughs> it was lovely. Um, the developmental pediatrician, um, who we really, really loved, who was a specialist in feeding issues, entertained with us the idea of taking her home on TPN. We really didn't know how else to deal with this severe failure to thrive. And so TPN was the option that we entertained. Um, and of course, we really were convinced that it was a storage disorder or severe mental retardation. And that was an incredibly hard thing to come to grips with because there wasn't a nice option. There wasn't the option of, oh, your child is going to be cured. It was either she's going to be severely mentally retarded or she's going to have a storage disorder and slowly waste away. So which choice do you want? Um, neither of those choices was good. So there was not a lot of hope that she would walk, talk, or eat on her own. And she was severely delayed at that time. And Lori remembers, <laughs> Dr. Harding remembers, because they took care of her. And we were all very, very frightened um, by Marcella's progression. We decided to have another child. Um, we really were convinced that she was not going to make it. And we thought that Amanda was going to be four. We wanted her to have a sibling, so we decided to have another child. Um, 
My favorite part was when I was told an abortion was still an option if needed, and we tested for more forms of dwarfism and storage disorders. Actually, I think we did some some prenatal testing, lots of prenatal testing, lots of high-level normal ultrasounds. I didn't have polyhydramnios, and her brother was huge. And um, But interestingly, when Julian was born, he became a huge motivation for Marcella. When he was born, she decided that she, it was time for her to get moving. <laughs> At age 2.7 years, things definitely turned around. That's great. We went, in 2001, we went to our first Costello Syndrome conference because at that point we thought, well, maybe there's something to that diagnosis that Dr. Zonana thought of at age five months. So we decided to go to Toronto, walk. And this is her, this is her taking her first steps. So this child that was so sick was walking. We were all so proud the day she could walk into um, genetics clinic and walking. It was indeed, we do think Marcella has Costello Syndrome. And it was such a huge relief to us to see that um, it wasn't anything, it wasn't a storage disorder. So now at this point, she's stable medically. We got a plane ticket, we got a really good deal, um, <laughs> which was important because of course. And that's where we met Dr. Lynn and Kate Rown and, they, and Bronwyn Kerr, and they said, yes indeed, we do think Marcella has Costello syndrome. And it was such a huge relief to us to see that um, it wasn't anything, it wasn't a storage disorder. So now at this point, she's stable medically. And when I say stable medically, I mean with 10 medications a day, G-tube feeds, 15 specialists, and lots of therapy, she's doing really well. If we were to take any of those things away, she would just be as medically fragile as she was. Um, and so I think sometimes people miss that because they see her and she looks so robust. But it definitely takes a lot to keep her at that point. Um, we do multiple weekly therapy visits, specialists, lots of scares, lots of serial ultrasounds. We found a microadenome in her brain, a liver mass. Um, she had some cardiomyopathy, which actually went away, which is great. But every time we do these ultrasounds, it's another stress for us. Every time we do these ultrasounds, we're reminded of just how fragile she is and what can happen. She's a mischievous child at this point. She says bad words when we're not looking. Her favorite bad words are in Spanish, which she says in her bilingual classroom to all the children, and then they laugh hysterically. Her favorite two people in the whole world are her Dr. Marty and the baby shot doctor, who was pregnant, and so, and she gives her, the, she's the growth, she's the endocrinologist, so you can see why shot doctor would be very fitting. She's in a mainstream general ed bilingual classroom. She loves to ask for her medications every morning and evening. <laughs> she's kind of like a little old woman. <laughs> She tries to help with her tube feeds. She hides her glasses because she absolutely can't stand wearing them. She steals her siblings' candies and then hides the wrappers. And her main fear in life is the mask, which is from anesthesia. She's definitely terrified of the mask. The siblings. <laughs> These are my other two children. Julian, you can see, is a very handsome little guy. And Amanda is a great kid. Um, they're very protective of Marcella. They protect her on the playground. They make sure that everybody's nice. And Julian made friends with the two biggest boys in his class because he wanted to make sure that if anybody got near Marcella, those boys could beat the other kids up. <laughs> um, but they, do, they are jealous because obviously with the amount of care that Marcella needs, it takes time away from them. And I'm not going to pretend it doesn't because it does. When I am going to appointments, I am not with them. Um, and so they are jealous. And they also have anxiety. And it's understandable because they've been through a lot. They definitely worry about their CS sibling dying. Julian has many nightmares about her drowning. Um, and Amanda definitely knows that um, things are very, um, very fragile. Marcella and CS. So for Marcella, having these conferences is incredibly important. She needs other children like her. She's holding it together in the normal population. and. With these CS kids, she can be herself. And this was great. We were over at the endo clinic, and they were pretending that they were doctors. It was great. <laughs> and um, she acts differently. It's definitely an amazing thing. I've never seen her act the way she does with her CS friends. There's an instant bond. Um, literally, when we brought Kelsey over to our house, which is the other little girl in the picture, Marcella and Kelsey disappeared. 
When we looked up, they were throwing toys out of the second story window and laughing hysterically and then chatting on their bed about who knows what. But it's very amazing. So, And then here, Marcella was getting a shot and Kelsey went with her and Marcella wanted her to sit next to her and hold her hand because Kelsey understands what it's like to be there and be getting these shots. Marcella's best advocates, and this is one thing that I think is really important for everybody. We really, the doctors that we um, really felt were helpful were, were the doctors that were very straightforward, told us exactly what was happening, but they were also optimistic. Um, it's, it's okay, I really can handle everything, but I also need optimism. Um, and sometimes it takes looking at all different options. Um, you can't be set on one way. It has to be, there has to be many different ways. And do as doctors, you are gatekeepers. You really are. And as parents, we really feel that. You can either facilitate good health care for our child or you can deny it. And I have had doctors that have denied health care for her, have denied treatments for her, and I've had doctors that have really facilitated access. And for me, it's very important that you facilitate access. Um, I also find doctors helpful that treat my child as they would treat their own child. We're not some, you know, extraterrestrial Martians. We're just like you. We're all the same. And we all have children, and we all want our children to be treated in the best possible way. Um, a big problem for lots of families with children with Costello syndrome is they all feel blamed at times for their child's failure to thrive, and it's easy for that to happen. And so um, I've heard many moms say, I'm so afraid to take my child to the doctor because I'm Thrive, not to jump to too many conclusions and not to blame us as parents because we're not always the ones to blame. <laughs> um, and again, understanding that we're not the reason our child has Thrive, not to jump to too many conclusions and not to blame us as parents because we're not always the ones to blame. <laughs> um, and again, Understanding that we're not the reason our child has a medical condition. It's just part of life. That's part of evolution. That's the way um, things go. Now, I would like to present Lisa Scheuer. I know we have to be out here soon, so I'm going to rush through this. Um, this is Marcella right here. <laughs> Stand up, Marcella? No. no. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Lisa Scheuer, and I'm a parent of a child that, uh, that had Costello syndrome who died of um, aggressive embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma relapse five years ago. So um, I was going to be an artist. Well, I kind of am still. <laughs> um, and I was working on becoming a professor of studio art. Okay. Ah, this mic. So I'm going to forget this one. Both. Oh, chat. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks. So um, I had planned to be a professor of studio art, and I was um, an adjunct professor working towards t uh, t looking for a tenure track position when I decided to go ahead and start a family, and um, I was going to have the most natural, painless, unmedical way possible, because I am uh, I'm a phobic. <laughs> I had to take Valium to get the Anderson thesis. But I also recognized that there were medical issues that I had to be careful about, So, but it's still the least possible. And then my son was born. Um, the pregnancy was unusual, but not quite totally unusual, still within normal limits, as um, most of our families have. And um, when he was born, we would, after my leaving the hospital, because I was sure the doctors didn't understand <laughs> that, that my oligo hydramnia, this, right, oligo, right, um, was not necessarily accurate. And so I left and then came back because of the, um, um, I'm going to have to read this now, late decelerations after the Bractus and Hicks's. Um, the C-section went normally, but he didn't breathe much. Um, they needed blow-by, so my husband kind of checked on him, and he went away, and 
then my husband came to me, so we really didn't know much. Um, he looked normal to us, and the doctors kept staring at our toes and, and telling us he had something. And, but everything kept on coming back normal. We had, had all the same tests of the dwarfism of the, um, the, uh, come on, Lisa. <laughs> Don, the storage disorders, yes, the alpha glucosidase being the last one. And um, so we kind of went through all the metabolic geneticist uh, stories and, and ideas, and he came up with, well, they don't know. So I actually found a doctor who helped us um, find the diagnosis. She was someone that uh, was referred to me by a college friend, and I, navigating the medical insurance system was very complicated, but we managed to do that and got the um, provisional diagnosis. So in the meantime, we went through failure to thrive, after 10 days in the ICU and coming home um, with mild bilirubinia and he just wouldn't feed and I went through everything I could breastfeeding and finally we went through the G-tube choice, which was hard for us actually, after a month of trying to do everything naturally. Um, and my only experience with the idea of G-tubes was that um, show about mental, uh, the mentally retarded where a man was, the doctor was shoving a tube down um, an adult patient's throat and pouring fluid down it. So we were thinking, forced feeding it. But I continued to breast pump for um, 18 months and mix it with formula to be able to raise the calories to pump him up. <laughs> um, so the, the other things besides the medical issues, which were really complicated, were trying to navigate all the systems of education um, private insurance, Medi-Cal, and all the different versions that we have in California. Um, the Children with Special Health Need, Care Needs Program, which I, I'm working there now, and it's taking me that long to figure out <laughs> what it is and how it works and how to help families navigate it. Our Developmental Disability Services Program, and then all the therapies and special education. Um, one of the first things I think that I didn't realize I was doing was to, uh, being pushed to become an advocate. Uh, being, I, I'm a curious person and I like to learn, so I learned quickly. The first team member was our gastroenterologist. Uh, he started off very cautiously, you know, because our pediatrician said, you need to go to him to get a G-tube. So we went to him to get a G-tube and he said, well, let me do, hang on. But after he recognized that Quinn was severely um, needing nutrition, he went ahead and said to us, the next words were, what would you like me to do? And this was before we knew what a gastroenterologist was. So I was like, I don't know, do what you do. Um, so he did put in the G2 by Peg and crashed. He um, coded blue, his heart, actually his heart kept pumping. He stopped breathing from the Demerol. And so that also was another thing that made the doctor <laughs> um, use us as a person to talk to. And um, he, for all his meds, he would give, the doctor would give us the, the parameters of what the, for the weight, how much to give, so that we could actually remind him when he actually did gain weight that it was time to change that. Our first anesthesiologist came to us after surgery and said, you need to keep a copy of this because he, he metabolized unusually. And before we could, uh, this was for a bilateral orchiopexy, before we could get to the, all the biopsies that we wanted to do, we needed to re-up all the anesthesia because he was starting to come out of it. So, And I tell all my parents um, on our listserv, be sure you get an anesthetic report because that will document the need. And a PICU resident uh, got really grumpy at me because I didn't have any meds lists. So he made one up for me, said you need the generic name, you need the brand name, you need the dosages, the strengths, and it's really great that the gastroenterologist showed you how to do this, but you have to do this for all your medicines, for the, for the ranges, for the um, dosages. So I became a little pharmacist. Um, here's Quinn after his open heart surgery, uh, resection of the left ventricular uh, septum for HCM. Um, I'm gonna give you an example of a bad <laughs> experience we had with a doctor, a uh, cardiologist, who told us to find that quiet place in our heart, which we didn't know what that meant, that we thought, okay, uh, high risk. Uh, and it was his, his colleague that we got to see 
at a, at one we couldn't see him once, who said, your kid has a 30% chance of dropping dead. And I burst into tears because I didn't, that's what place, quiet place in your heart means, and, and I just didn't realize. And so the report said, mother became extremely lachrymose. And I got a copy of that, so thank you. <laughs> um, and that was the time when we were looking at sending our kid to a different school district for um, uh, deaf and hard of hearing because my son couldn't, he couldn't speak, but he could hear, but, and he communicated with it. American Sign Language, and we were going to put him on a bus for half an hour, and he might die on that bus, and I just, that's all I could think of. Um, the, the same doctor told another mom of a child that I'm pretty sure has Costello, but I'm a parent, <laughs> so I, I really can't say that. Um, I saw her at 12 years old at the zoo. She had a G-tube, she had braces, she had a trach, um, and she held out her G-tube to the nurse to get, because she was hungry. And so I gave my a little note to the nurse to give to the mom, and we talked, and we had the same doctor. And she, at the time that her child was an infant, um, the doctor said, your child has a very bad heart situation. Take her home and love her, and, because she might not live. And so she did just that. And she was a single mother at the time. This was a twin, a fraternal twin, and she had a five-year-old. So it's hard, here I am, mother with a husband who's there for me, and this only one child, and I had a lot of difficulties. You can imagine that when this mom heard this, that's what she expected to do, and that's what she needed to do because that's all she could handle. So no therapies, because why put the child through that pressure if she's not gonna live? Give her the quality of life of just having fun, or you know, don't go to the doctors often. She refused um, tubes for the ears, and all from this one statement from one doctor. So I do warn you, please be careful what you say to us because we'll take it all sorts of ways. Um, the things, no, why did I put this? Okay. <laughs> um, I think it, there are parents who are afraid to know. I had a friend whose child had got stitches, a healthy child, just like my son here, and this is the first time that he had an issue that was not Costello related, so we were very happy. It's like, okay, a typical kid hospital visit. Um, a friend of ours from grad school, uh, their child fell and hit his head. They took him to the hospital, and my first advocate thing was to say, so did they let you go into the room with your kid, you know, and all that stuff? They said, no, thank God, they didn't let us. And so I thought, okay, I have to think carefully about how other people, even smart people, you know, who should know better, <laughs> have certainly different uh, angles on how to be an advocate for their child. Um, it, okay. I'm trying to remember why I have the slow empty. Um, I know. It was very hard for us in the hospital to get doctors to, to listen to us because our kids are just so off the curve. So they couldn't believe, none of them, not even the gastroenterologists, could believe how slowly our kids' stomachs emptied. Uh, when we were trying to get off Reglan, he said, oh, it'll take three to five days. It took us a month. We did it his way first, and then he started to throw up again, and then we said, can, you, can we try it our way? And it was a month. Um, when we had to get fluids to in for um, scans and stuff, he, they, you know, 160 cc's is no big deal for most kids, but we couldn't, we had to spend more time, and the radiologist was pissed at us, and he said, yeah, we just can't do it. In the PACU, um, it's so important to allow parents who want to go in there uh, to, to be their child's advocate. I, the pain management, it, we didn't have clarification of, of what could be used on the charts, so I was able to clarify what wasn't there, his, his allergic reactions and stuff. And then pictures in the NICU, if you can help families remember to bring pictures into the, into the hospital for them. It's so important, especially in the NICU where the doctors see a prone child. And to see them in their home in, in typical situation, I think, helps them motivated, get motivated. Here's my son with the pictures. Um, more important is for, was for Quinn because it was for him to be thinking about home and, and what life really is like, and this is temporary. I also had trouble communicating that my son was allergic to Peptamin Jr. because everyone said it's, it's elemental. Um, but he was overproducing mucus so much and the meds that were um, provided, the secondary to the side effects to the meds for the chemo were also narrowing his airway further. 
So we had a strong debate, all the staff, on whether or not a trach is, was in order, and we decided to go ahead for the trach. And then it was a month later that I thought of the idea, test the peptamin junior by trying another uh, elemental, and if, if, if it's not the peptamin junior, nothing will happen. And with, with um, five and X pediatric, the mucus cleared up enough to him, but we still had a trach. Um, another, well, I won't go, okay, time-wise. Um, another th pressure for me was, was the myths that we have in our culture, which we don't even recognize. And, and I have this picture because my mother-in-law, you know, she's actually an okay woman, but <laughs> uh, really, she uh, epitomized the, the mentality of if you name it, it will be fixed. And we, so, you know, to the point when we were recognized that it just was not anything doctors knew, she kept on hammering on us, which was a lot of pressure because that was also supposed to be our support. Um, I was shocked at what amniocentesis doesn't provide, um, and all the tests later that came within normal limits. I, we want to do t-shirts for our kids that say WNL on them. Uh, and in finding doctors, I found doctors who really didn't know. That was the, sort of the secret was someone who could say, I, I don't know. Okay, I'll go faster. Home health nurses, they can be good, they can be bad. Most of them are bad because they, they go there because they're not being um, monitored. But the gems that some parents can find, are, they're just, just crucial and more for their relationship than for the work they do. Here's my daughter who is an, a year old here, not messing with the tubes, kids can learn. <laughs> Um, but it was really hard because we couldn't travel. Our, my family is on the East Coast, so I never saw them while, while my son was alive. And um, getting really close, you guys. <laughs> Two more slides, I think. Um, it was very hard for Quinn, of course, who wanted to go home. And this is a slide that's really hard for me to show because this boy, Frankie, was in the hospital for one day. He had leukemia, suspected leukemia, but the hospital he came from, they gave him antibiotics, which wiped out what, was, what existed. So we didn't know that. We went out to have lunch or snack or something. When we came back, he had gone. The bed, uncharacteristically, was made up. And my son at the door who was bringing something for him, his whole body, just, where's my friend? And this was the first and only time in the hospital, despite child life, where he had someone that he could relate to and hang out with. So if you can encourage that also with your clients, your patients, sorry, in my, my field we call them clients, um, I, I just can't say enough about helping them make friends in the hospital because it's really lonely. Um, through working at, with Costello syndrome and taking advantage, carpe diem, we were able to, Dawn and I were able to go to, to um, the American Society of Human Genetics and um, Dawn, with Dawn's molecular biology experience, after Francis Collins talked about progeria and, and Farnesyl transferase inhibitors, Dawn pointed out the part in the article so you wouldn't have to read the whole thing and call us later. And right there and then, he started giving us contacts. It was really exciting. And as a matter of fact, the result of the, some of the people coming to this symposium is because of that first meeting. Thanks to the Genetic Alliance, I have to thank them. Uh, so now, with all the lessons learned, I work as the chief of family support at our local uh, Title V program in Los Angeles County of 50,000 children in our program. And I'm there to help with family-centered care, which I, is sort of a learning as well as a training experience. That's kind of fun. I'm currently president of Costello Syndrome Family Network, and we'll see if that continues uh, this Saturday. And I have to continually learn that parents are not like me <laughs> and to accommodate their needs, which is also exciting. So here's my contact information, um, which I think will be available. And thank you. Thank you.